In this video, I'm going to talk about two different types of social influence, which can lead to two different types of conformity. So continuing the discussion of conformity, that's when we go along with behavior, not because of any special uh, rule or command or anything making us do it. It's voluntary. Uh, with conformity, uh, we can be influenced by how uncertain we are in the situation. In unfamiliar situations, uh, people are concerned with standing out, with displaying the incorrect behavior. Sometimes you walk into a room, you walk into a crowd, and you have no idea what you're supposed to say, what you're supposed to do, and it can it can be useful to look around and, and think, well, what are, what are other people doing? Maybe you go to a fancy dinner and you think, oh no, I have no idea, like, which utensil to use? What am I supposed to do with my napkin? Uh, how am I supposed to eat this fancy food I've never eaten before? So you can look around at people and, and say, okay, oh, okay, so that person is using that utensil. And, oh, they're, they're cracking this food open before they eat it. Okay, good to know, good to know. And okay, I see that they are sipping. They're not, they're not gulping this drink. Okay, I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to try to do things the right way. These are things that we can find ourselves doing in unfamiliar, uncertain situations. So people feel anxious about fitting in, and so they might result, uh, they might resort to conformity. And so you have two types of influence here. You have informational and normative influence. Informational, which can lead to informational conformity, right? Informational influence has to do with that uncertainty. You know, if you truly have, have no idea what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to behave, sometimes you're just looking for, I don't know what the answer is. Please tell me, please tell me, how am I supposed to act? What am I supposed to say in this situation? And so one classic test of informational social influence, uh, it comes from a study uh, in 1936 on an optical illusion called the autokinetic effect. The autokinetic effect is, um, is this phenomenon where something that's not actually moving looks like it's moving because of the movement of your own eyes. So the object is not actually moving, but you think it's moving. So they have a point of light that's actually staying in place and you're in a dark room, all right? Point of light shown in a dark room and they asked their participants how much is the light moving? How far did the light move? It actually didn't move at all, all right? So technically they're, they're tricking them or were tricking them, all right? But in this situation, you're, you don't know what the correct answer is. Technically, there is no correct answer. By the way, the researcher associated with this uh, is um, Sheriff or Sharif. I'm not actually sure of the pronunciation. Once again, something that I've read many times. I'm not entirely sure of the pronunciation. Uh, he is also um, uh, well known for the robber's cave study, which will be covered in a different video. And so in the autokinetic effect study, the, the participants came in uh, and they had different situations in terms of whether other people were present and what answer they actually gave. Uh, and so there was one control group where uh, there were no confederates in the group. All right. Um, what is a confederate? We might have gone over this before, but if we haven't, if you need a refresher, a confederate is somebody who's in on the study, someone who's been given a script, an actor who's working on the study. So they act like they were a real participant, but they're not actually a real participant. So they have been told what to say. All right. So the control group had no confederates. Everybody who gave the answer, by the way, they had to answer out loud. How much do you think that it moved? They answer out loud to come up with an answer. Uh, and that control group estimated a four inch movement. Technically there was no movement, but they estimated four inches. And then in one experimental group, an experimental group is where something is done, something is manipulated regarding the independent variable of the confederates, their behavior is where you see the independent variable here. The Confederate uh, estimated, the, the actor estimated 15 inches. So they went big, they went high. They estimated 15 inches and the true participants, they shifted towards this, this larger answer. Uh, they conformed around that estimate. They gave larger estimates that were closer to 15 inches. Now there was a third experimental, or a third group, a second experimental group. The third group had the Confederate give a smaller, more reasonable 
number, closer to what the actual participants in the control group gave. So in the third group, the Confederate estimated just two inches. The real participants also conformed around that number. There was evidence that the real participants were making their answers match the answer that the Confederate gave. And in the absence of the Confederate, they gave around four inches. And so in this case, since they didn't know what answer they were supposed to give, there was the assumption that, well, they, they weren't certain. So in the case of uncertainty, they seek information from the group. All right. And by the way, there are some criticisms of this study. I mean, it's been since the 30s. There's been time for there to be criticisms. It's a classic study. It's not necessarily a perfect study. Uh, you know, a lot of people said, well, the problem that there wasn't a definite correct answer could could actually lead to you know lead to it being tricky um and, but the, you mean, it did inspire a lot of work all right and one of the things that that it did is it inspired another classic study now before we get into this next classic study we have to introduce uh normative social influence or normative conformity so solomon ash is the researcher who conducted sort of the classic study on normative social influence. Now, Ash uh, was familiar with the autokinetic effect studies and he was inspired he wanted to know more, he wanted to expand. And um, so with normative social influence, this is less because you genuinely don't know what the answer is or what you're supposed to do. This is when you publicly conform to gain social approval, to not look like a weirdo and avoid rejection. So this can happen even if you do not agree with the behavior or the response or the answer that you give. Normative social influence is because you don't want to stand out. You don't want to be the, the odd one in a particular crowd or a particular group. Now, when we talk about norms, there are two types of norms. You have descriptive norms and injunctive norms. Descriptive norms uh, refer to the usual thing that's done, what is commonly done, what most people do. So descriptive norms are just, eh, that's what we usually do. Works, you know. Injunctive norms. This is what is socially sanctioned. So not just what is usually done. This is what we like to be done. This is what people are supposed to do. All right. So keeping norms in mind, there are the two types, descriptive and injunctive. Now, so Ash is looking at this and saying, okay, how can we study people's conformity in a situation where their conformity is strictly because they don't want to be the oddball in the group. They don't want to be the one that stands out. And um, in his classic study, and I have a separate video that I'm going to link to that shows uh, the type of stimuli that were shown in his classic study, and they've, um, they, they've uh, replicated this since then. Um, but in his original study, uh, he had his participants, and it's one of these studies, it was all it was all male participants, uh, probably all white male or predominantly white male participants sample. I always like to point out, because I don't feel like students under, I don't feel like students uh, catch on to how often that was just not, not labeled because it was so common. It was so common, like, oh, our samples are all male and mostly white. You know, nowadays we're like, oh yeah, maybe we should replicate with some other folks. But anyway, so in the ASH study, one of the many classic studies that has that limitation. Uh, in the ASH study, participants came in and there were also Confederates involved in this study, but participants would arrive and they were told, this is a study of people's perception of line lengths. All right, so how long lines are. And they, uh, the answers were not that difficult to give. They would show them three lines and they would say, okay, which one of these lines is closest in length to the control line? They'd show them a line say, which one of the three lines that, we just, that we're showing you is closest in length to this line? And the, one of the big differences was whether they were answering by themselves or anonymously or whether they were answering with other people around. Now, there was a, con a control condition with no Confederates. The idea with the control condition Nobody else around to influence your behavior. It's just you. 
And in the controlled condition, people were really, really good at determining which line matched the other line uh, exactly. And so you had 98% accuracy. When there were no Confederates present, there was 98% accuracy. Then they tested people with other people present with Confederates. And the Confederates were trained to give the obviously wrong answer. Now, that's a really important part, all right? An answer that's obviously wrong. Like if your eyes are working, if you are able to see, you, and you don't have a visual problem, you don't have a perceptual problem, and most people, they, they would have screened that out probably. They, you can look at that and you're like, that answer that they're giving is wrong. And they had people answer out loud again. So you could hear their answers. answers. And the real participant didn't answer first. They got to hear other people answer before they gave their response. And participants gave the wrong answer, the obviously wrong answer, 37% of the time. 75% conformed and gave the obviously wrong answer at least once. Now, I do like to point out, a lot of times when students answer test questions about this, sometimes they will get this element wrong and they'll say everybody conformed. No, not everybody. It wasn't like the sweeping majority conformed all the time. Um, only 37 percent um only 37 percent showed this consistent conformity all right uh, 75 percent conformed at least once that is pretty high all right so there were some people who stuck to their guns there were some people who were like okay i don't know what's going on here but these people don't don't know how lines work because they're wrong and they gave the correct answer but a lot more people than you would hope just went ahead and, and said okay that one you know, even though they're like, in their head, they're probably thinking, I don't know what I don't understand here, but all right. So they gave the obviously wrong answer. All right. Now, uh, they have expanded upon the ASH study over time uh, in a review in 1996. Now, to many of my students, that probably seems like a long time ago. All right. But to my mind, that's fairly recent. Uh, but certainly time had passed between that and the original study. I don't remember the original the year of the original study, I want to say 1950s, but you know, early, there'd been time. Time had passed and studies, other studies had been conducted and 133 studies were reviewed and conformity in the United States has declined. Oh, here it is, since the early 50s. I was right, 50s. Uh, but conformity still increases in certain situations. So we see less overall conformity, but we still see more likelihood of conformity, normative conformity, in situations where the size of the majority increases. So the more you are outnumbered, the more likely it is you are to conform. Uh, the stimuli are more ambiguous. So that might have to do with informational conformity. If you, if the more likely it is that you really don't know the answer or you doubt the answer, you see more conformity. If the majority is in one's own social in-group, if the people doing the other thing are people that you relate to, they're, you know, they're in clubs with you, they live in your dorm, they're people you know, they're your friends, then you see more conformity. And I mentioned how originally they were testing a lot of men. All right, eventually we started having more gender diversity in our samples. And so they started including women in their samples. The more women in a sample, the more conformity you see. All right, now please don't think that that means that women are always conforming, all right, just that you do see higher rates with more women in the sample. All right, so that, that's, those are the classic studies. The classic studies having to do with informational versus normative conformity, different motivations with, you know, with the autokinetic, the auto, autokinetic effect studies. You know, the assumption was, they don't know the answer, so that's why they're conforming. With the ASH study, since the answer was obvious, they're assuming that they're conforming just because they don't want to look like a weirdo in the group. And in fact, they did do some extra manipulations. Like they had, in some cases, the person was led to believe that they, the participant was led to believe that they arrived late and they allowed them to write down their answer instead of saying it out loud. Uh, and the ones who didn't have to say it out loud, they were more likely to give the correct answer rather than to conform. So it is kind of that hint, like it's the fact that, that you know, that it's people knowing 
<laughs> that they're not conforming more so than, you know, they, they're really, they're looking for the correct response or answer. All right.